Hi, everybody. I'm really excited today because, well, I've been eating marshmallow bunnies all day and that makes somebody excited and hyper. So I'm um, glad you're here today. Um, I'm also excited because Dennis Mamana is going to show us about everything he knows, well, part of everything he knows about taking pictures of Aurora. And he's been taking a lot of pictures of Aurora through the years. And it's really fun to go on a trip up to Alaska with them and, and take pictures and stuff like that. And you got them in your memory book for a long, long time. Hey, let me tell you about a few things that are coming up in the near future. Um, well, we're taking off next week. We're not going to be here. Oh, I got to start share my screen, don't I? Back over here. Share my screen. Boink. Boink. Okay, and now we're back to the calendar. Dennis is here tonight, and next week we're off because we're all going to go on Thursday and Friday. We'll be at the Northeast Astro Imaging Conference, and on Saturday and Sunday, we'll be at me. By we, I mean, I think Tim and me will be there. And the rest of the guys can't make it this year, but maybe next year they'll be there. Uh, Tom's coming back next week to show us how he uh, does his lucky imaging. He told us a little bit about using the telescope a while back. And then the week after that, it's kind of going to be interesting because we got a guy that images with the big Dob on an Altaz mount. So, um, you know, Dobs are on our Altaz mounts, and he's going to show us how it can be done, and he does a pretty good job doing it. Um, and then Russ Croman, he brings his real intelligence to tell us about deconvolution and some other things he does with that kind of stuff. Warren's here the week after that. Randall Kafis is going to take us back to where we all started. He's going to tell us about things he wished he knew back when he was just starting off. And we'd, we'd really like you sitting over in, in, the, um, in the comments section over here, making... making um, comments along the way as to what's happening and things like that. Let's see. Back to the calendar. Anyway, we got a lot of things going. And so I think you guys will enjoy it. Okay. One of the things we're going to be doing, hang on for a second. There we go. Uh, I had that sound in my ear from going into the, um, the other program. I forgot to turn the sound off over there. One of the things that we've got coming up in august august 27th 2023 but you got to start getting ready for it now it's really important and i'm going to stop sharing my screen here so that my good friend rory can tell you what he knows about workshops rory take it all right can you guys hear me okay yeah. all right i'm going to start sharing here just so i can take you guys over to the astro imaging uh channel.org can you guys see that okay yeah yeah perfect so uh we got uh kevin moorfield uh to submit ngc 2467 skull and crossbones nebula and if you go to the astro imaging channel.org and you click on tac workshop right here it'll take you to the page we're already on and then scroll down and you'll be able to uh, download all the files you need to edit this image and submit them on the same page. Here's the image right here, Skull and Crossbones Nebula, really beautiful image. Looking forward to everyone's submissions by August 13th, and then we're gonna present on the 27th, and, and Kevin will be here to share a little bit about uh, his image and the equipment he used to get that. So, uh, you know, if you could um, download those files and submit them, we are, uh, super excited to see all the the variants in in everyone's images and uh um we would love to have you do like a three to five minute presentation on your imaging processing highlights thank you guys that's all i got uh, rory you want to yep. tell them what an, what an exotic uh, structure this is and the fact that it's only visible or imageable from the southern hemisphere so it's not something that our northern hemisphere guys ever get to look at or image Yes, yes, that's right. From what I understand, it's barely visible in the, the northern hemisphere. It, it can be done, but it's mostly a southern target. Also, Rory, while you're here, could you scroll down a little bit and show people that they could do a whole lot of the other. We've, we've been doing this for quite some time. And yeah, so. if you guys want some things to practice with, go for it. 
Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Alex, for bringing that up. Um, if you're looking for ex some examples of what we're looking for, all the past TAC workshops are posted on this page as well here, so you get an idea of, of uh, how to present if you're uh, willing to um, give us a three to five minute presentation. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. Thanks a lot, Rory. Thank you. And, uh, Dennis, you ready to fire yourself up and get on it? Ready to go. Okay. Take over. Tell us who you okay. are and what you do. Well, let me uh, let me go to my uh, my screen here. Hopefully, this will work. And uh, what I want to do for this evening is I want to is is, is that physical now? Uh, so we see the PowerPoint, but not in presentation mode. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Good to go. Hang on one second. Wait, I want to. I want to make sure I understood what you said because. Uh, let's see, what am I doing here? It... Okay, so I I got rid of it now. But what was it there before? So, so so you were right. Go back to PowerPoint and and go into the presentation mode. You were you were good to go. Okay. Now going in. Yeah. Perfect. You're all set? So what I would like to do today is I want to talk, talk to you about photographing the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. Now, you know, I, I've listened to you guys for a long time, and I'm telling you, some of the technical stuff you guys get into, it's like you might as well be speaking Mandarin, quite frankly, to me. Uh, I've tried a lot of this stuff on my own. It just doesn't make any sense. But I've been photographing with very simple equipment, uh, camera, tripod, the night sky for well, I guess it's now 56 or 57 years I've been doing it. And uh, of course, it's it's not as simple as Bruce's program last week where you were you're photographing, doing long exposure photographs of the sun with a with a tin can strapped to a fence post. I mean, that was remarkable how those images turned out. This is much more traditional and it's a camera and tripod. And I wanna to talk to you about photographing the Northern Lights. And you might wonder why I wanna do this because the, the Northern Lights, uh, you can see them from many places on the globe. It may not be believable at this point, but it, I think it will be. Uh, these are the kind of photos. I've been taking trips to Alaska now for 25 years uh, and to Norway and Iceland and Canada. And these are the types of images that you can, you can capture with a very simple camera, very simple tripod but you have to have some knowledge in order to be able to do it, just like any, any other types of imaging. So tonight, what I would like to do is, before we get into the actual imaging itself, is go over three things. One, I wanna talk about how to understand the lights. It's very important to understand the subject that you are shooting. That's the way to get the best types of images. Then it's important to understand how to predict their appearance as much as it is possible to be able to do. But once you can do that, then you can be in position to be able to photograph them. And that's what I will spend the majority of this evening talking about actually imaging them. But we have to understand some of the basics. So first of all, let's ask ourselves, what is the aurora? Just, just what is this thing, the Northern Lights? Well, if you go to a, di a dictionary, you'll see a definition. Uh, what, the first definition might be something like the dawn which is kind of an archaic definition. But the second definition is either of the two luminous bands seen in the, seen in the night sky. In the Southern Hemisphere, we call them the Aurora Australis. In the Northern Hemisphere, the Aurora Borealis. So you got the Northern Lights and the Southern Lights. The whole thing starts at the sun. So it's very important to understand the sun. If we have any solar observers or photographers here, you certainly are doing that already. We know when we look at a white light image of the sun, we see it looking something like this. It's got just a, a, a pretty featureless disk, although you can see some fine features there. But the most uh, prominent features are the sunspots, the dark spots that we see. Those sunspots increase in number and decrease in number over a, an approximate 11 year cycle. We call that the sunspot cycle. And it's not only the um, The act, it's the activity of the sun producing these sunspots. And if you take a look here on this on this chart, you can see the uh, 
I don't know if you can see my arrow there or not, probably not, but the, if you if you see back in the year 2000, we were at a what we call a solar maximum. We dropped down to around a solar minimum in 2010, back up to a maximum around 2014 or so, down to a solar minimum, which seemed, by the way, to last forever in 2020. And now we're back up the curve, going up on cycle 25, and we're getting very close to the top, which we should reach around 2025, maybe 2026. And we're actually ahead of schedule in terms of the number of sunspots. Now, why does this matter? Well, the sunspots is a sort of an indication of the activity of the sun. The sun is constantly belching outward electrically charged particles that are going in all directions. Occasionally, you get these explosions off the face of the sun, like the one you just saw on the upper right. The, these charged particles are going off in all directions. Now, the Earth is sitting way out there, and 93 million miles away from the sun. It's very, very tiny. But when some of these charged particles interact with the Earth, when they intersect with the Earth, this is when we know we could potentially get some aurora borealis or aurora australis displays. But you have to be paying attention to this. Uh, if you take a look at how this process happens, this is how an aurora is born. The sun, as I say, is continually blowing out this solar wind and coronal mass explosions that are being tossed out into space, electrically charged particles. When that material encounters the Earth, the first thing it encounters is our magnetic field, which protects us from these charged particles. As this material passes the Earth, the electrically charged particles spiral down the magnetic field lines of the Earth and impact the atmosphere of the Earth near the North and South Poles of the Earth not at the North and South Poles. We're talking about the magnetic poles now, not the, the geographic poles. It actually forms an oval around the magnetic poles, maybe 20 or so, 25 degrees uh, across. This is what the Earth would look like on a night, perhaps on a simulation, uh, what the Earth might look like from space on a night where we have a lot of uh, auroral displays. If you were to see these from above, as astronauts in the International Space Station can do. Um, it wouldn't look quite like this. Uh, what you would see, you would see these ovals, these aurora ovals that go around the magnetic pole of the Earth. And as the Earth turns underneath these poles, uh, uh, underneath these, uh, these ovals, let's say you're in Alaska, for example, as the Earth turns under these, those are ovals appear to rise in the northeastern sky, pass overhead, and ultimately set in the northwestern sky. But of course, it's the rotation of the Earth that is causing this. And these are the kinds of images you want to look at when you want to try to predict the, uh, the appearance of an aurora. If you were flying through these as international space station astronauts do from time to time, this is how they would appear. The particles from the sun impact the atmosphere and the gases in the atmosphere, particularly oxygen and nitrogen, glow with distinctive colors. The oxygen tends to produce green, it can also produce some red. Uh, the uh, nitrogen definitely produces red and can produce some blue as well. And so by these highly charged particles, moving very rapidly through the atmosphere and impacting these gases above us. They cause the gases to glow, and we see from the Earth what we call the aurora borealis or the aurora australis. From below, from the surface of the Earth, this is a video shot by my Tuan colleague um, up in Yellowknife, Canada. This is a real-time video of what the auroras would look like from the ground. Now, you can imagine that photographing this moving system going on overhead is a bit of a challenge. We're obviously not using big equipment. We're not using magnification. We're not using uh, telescopes, uh, atmospheric dispersion correctors, none of this stuff. We're just a simple camera and a tripod. The eye, this is pretty much what they look like. They're constantly moving. And trying to get a photograph of them is a little challenging. I always like to say that it's easy to photograph the aurora, but it's very difficult to get a good photograph. These things are constantly moving. 
and you are typically dealing with very cold temperatures and sometimes very strong winds as well. If you were taking a look at this from a morphology perspective, in other words, what kind of shapes can the aurora produce? Now, this is really kind of interesting because there are some very generic shapes, but I will tell you, I was up in uh, Alaska uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and one of the nights I could not for the life of me figure out what shapes they were producing. They were just very, very odd this year. This is something we call homogeneous arcs. Typically at the very beginning of an evening, if you're up in very high latitudes, Alaska, Canada, and so on, if you're in very high latitudes, the evening will begin with featureless arcs like this going across the northeastern sky. And that's because the oval is over the northeastern part of the world at this point, and that's the direction we're looking. But as the Earth turns underneath these, these arcs can actually start to develop. They can go through what we call a breakup phase, where they start to actually break up into, well, what looks like a rising vapor column and a rayed arc, where these rays are drifting back and forth, dancing like like piano keys on a, on a player piano just moving autonomously. And as these rays, these curtains that we see, move over top of us as they typically do during the evening, sometimes they can become very bright. And when you look up one of these rays, you're actually looking up one of these sheets at the very bottom of the image, you're looking at the, uh, the aurora maybe about 60 miles up. And up at the top, where it's very red, you're looking at the high atmosphere, you're looking up around 200 miles. So you're actually seeing three dimensions here. These raid curtains will move over top of you from time to time. And when they do, now it's starting to move closer to overhead. And when it gets completely overhead, you are looking up one of those vertical rays and you are seeing what we call a corona. This is, this is the best thing you can hope for on a really good night of auroras. Coronas are exploding with brightness and color and they move so fast that sometimes it's absolutely impossible to photograph them. Then after the whole system sort of, sort of wears itself out, we have what we call the recovery phase, where we get this very diffuse aurora that kind of covers the entire sky. I happen to like photographs. They're very, they're very quiet, they're very faint, and they give me an opportunity to photograph something that isn't damping around so much. And then, of course, you may have heard of something known as STEEF, Strong Thermal Emissions Velocity Enhancement. It looks like an aurora, but it's not. It's actually a very rapid stream of charged particles moving through the atmosphere. But you cannot see these very well from very high latitudes. If you're sort of in mid-high latitudes, like in southern Canada, northern U.S., for example, that you can you can stop doing this for 25 and get to see them. So we'll, we'll see if, uh, if if one day I actually we actually get to meet. <clears throat> so how do you predict these very very unusual phenomena? Well, again, it goes back to the sun. The first thing that when I am uh, at home in Southern California, and even when I'm up north, I check spaceweather.com. Space weather will keep you up to date on what the sun is doing, how active it is, what are the chances for flares or CMEs, coronal mass, exp uh, uh, coronal mass explosions, extinctions, whatever you want to call them. I forget what the exact term is. We just call them CMEs. And so that's the first step. But if you really want to follow these, I highly recommend looking up some apps for your smartphone. These are three that I use. I have an iPhone, but they have apps. Just go to your, 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 your app store. Um, these are the ones I use for the iPhone, but there are some from Android and, and others as well. Amazing Aurora is, is my favorite, but Northern Alights and Aurora Alerts are two that I use also. And the reason I like these three is because I can set parameters to be able to receive alerts, to be able to receive uh, messages when conditions are right for the aurora to appear wherever I happen to be on the globe at the time. So when I'm up in Alaska, I don't use these notifications because we get lights frequently. 
But when I'm in Southern California, I do because we can get them from time to time and I want to pay close attention to what's actually happening. The next thing you want to check out is this that comes from the uh, NOAA from the Southwest, uh, say the, uh, the SWPC Aurora Probability Map Space Weather Prediction Center. And what it does is it produces a probability map of seeing the northern lights from where you are. And if you look at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see the probability of the aurora when it's a dark green color like this, and you happen to be under that dark green color, you have maybe a five or 10% chance of seeing the lights for that night. That doesn't mean you won't see them, it just means it's a low probability. As the night goes on, as solar activity increases, or as the activity of uh, the magnetic activity in the atmosphere increases, you wind up getting brighter colors, yellows and oranges and reds. And that's what you want to look for. And that turns during the course of the night. So we can actually see what the probabilities are for you seeing the northern light from wherever you happen to be. But the most important feature to look for uh, where in, in middle or southern northern latitudes that makes doesn't make much sense southern northern latitudes but i'm talking about places like like southern uh, latitudes like virginia and florida and Can california and so on is looking at a number known as the k index the planetary k index which is an estimation of the electric magnetic activity in the atmosphere of the earth it goes from zero to nine when it's zero we are not going to see anything at all. Now, if you're in Alaska, if you're up near the auroral oval at around 64 or 65 degrees north latitude, yeah, you're going to see auroras even at, even when the K index is around zero or one or two. You're definitely going to see them. I don't use the K index when I'm up in northern climates, but when I'm in Southern California or anywhere between the north and here, the K index is very important. The K index, like I said, goes from zero to nine. The higher it is, the more probability is you're going to see some lights. This is a an estimation of what the auroral, uh, what the K index must be for you to see lights. And you can see when you're, let's say, in the southern part of the U.S. or in Europe or Asia, and you're in the southernmost part of the U.S., if the K index is seven or eight or nine, you are almost certain to be able to see some sort of auroral displays. Now, this doesn't happen very often. The last time it happened was a couple of weeks ago when I was in Alaska. We got uh, K index, uh, K indices up around seven and eight, and people were photographing the lights from Florida and Virginia and New Mexico. I obviously was not in Southern California at the time, so I couldn't photograph them, but it's just as well because it was cloudy here that night anyway. It was on the 23rd of March. What happened in the year 2004? We were down near solar minimum, actually. On July 25th, 2004, we got up to a K index of eight and nine, and you can believe I was outside with the camera and tripod ready to go. And this is what I was able to capture on the morning of July 27th. You can see the aurora, the blues at the very top are caused by nitrogen. The reds also are caused by some nitrogen and oxygen. But this is looking north. And uh, this is from the Anza Borrego Desert in Southern California. Very trying to photograph these things when it's 95 degrees outside. Uh, that's a very, very strange to be able to do that. This was in 2005, on May 13, we got another blast like this, and I was able to capture this to the north. So the, it is entirely possible for the northern lights to appear from very southerly latitudes. The trick is to be able to pay attention to them, be able to guess when they're going to appear, to pay attention to some of the weather. Outside with a camera when they occur. Finally, we want to talk about photographing them. You can use very, very simple equipment for this. We're not going to use the heavy duty stuff that you do for astro imaging. Simple camera, tripod is all that's necessary. In fact, the newest smartphones are so good that you can even do great images of the northern lights with a smartphone 
doesn't even need to be on a tripod. You can actually do it handheld. Now, the advantages of a smartphone are that it's lightweight, it's quick, you can do it handheld or on a tripod. It's already connected to the internet. So if you wanna just fire something off, an image off to somebody, you can do it very quickly. And what's really great is a lot of the newer uh, phones, the native camera app is really terrific. I've tried a number of camera apps for the Aurora, and the best I found is the one that comes with my iPhone. It's so it, it, that's the one that I just use, and I aim it, and I take the picture. It's pretty automatic. If you're using a DSLR, you have the advantage of being able to open your apertures considerably wider than you can with a phone. You're going to get much higher quality images. You have more control of your settings and you can change lenses, which is a little more difficult on a smartphone. So if you have a DSLR and you have a tripod and you have an internet connection, you can learn when the auroras are going to appear, where you live or where you're traveling and get out and actually try to photograph these things. Let's talk very first about the generalities of, of shooting lights with a DSLR. <clears throat> a couple of very quick things to mention. If you have your camera on a tripod, the IS, which is image stabilization, or VR, vibration reduction, depending on your camera brand, must be off. If it isn't off, your images will be soft. That is made only for handheld imaging. Autofocus must be off, and you must focus manually to infinity. That is not a trivial problem, by the way. It's a little more challenging than it might seem at first. The strobe needs to be off. And you want to, in advance, select foregrounds that you might include in these sky photos to be able to give them some personality. You happen to be in the very far north, Iceland or Norway or Alaska or northern Canada, it is going to be very cold when it's dark. Now, of course, up in the northern, up, up near the Arctic Circle, it's dark only between approximately uh, September and March when you get darkness for long periods of time in the evening. But that's also called wintertime. And it's cold, really cold. Some nights can get down to 20, 30, 40 below zero. Fahrenheit, 40 below zero, of course, is both Fahrenheit and Celsius, and it's, it is very, very cold. The batteries in your cameras drain very quickly. It can be extremely dry in some of those locations, so you have to be very careful about static electricity, especially if you're walking across a carpet and you touch your DSLR, you could, you could perhaps cause some problems. Condensation is a real problem in those conditions because if you're outside trying to use your camera, just the breath you are breathing is moisture laden and it falls onto your camera. Since your camera is very cold also, that moisture will condense and instantly turn to ice. And I don't have to tell you, your evening is over very quickly. And of course, when you bring your camera or tripod indoors, you want to make sure it stays cold while you bring it into the warm, moist air. And you all know what happens when you come indoors from a cold night and you, uh, you have eyeglasses on, for example, everything fogs up. You put your camera in a camera bag, for example, that is out in the cold, seal it up, bring it in, let it warm up slowly and naturally, and you won't have a problem because you will be running outdoors at some point when the aurora kicks up once again. The biggest, the, the most common question I get is what settings should I use? Now, just think about that. Uh, every aurora display is different. The aurora can be as faint as invisible to the eye, and it can be as bright as something that will actually cast your shadow on the ground and everything in between. And it can change literally within seconds. So I cannot answer the question what that is. But a good starting point is, let's say, eight seconds exposure, F2.8, ISO 1600. My point isn't to use those numbers. So
it could have been a dead show. When I'm in the northern race in Alaska, for example, I'm constantly changing my exposure setting. I leave my ISO where it is, wherever it happens to be set. I leave my aperture wide open, and I change my shutter speeds. Depends on the activity of the aurora itself. So you have to be very, very conscious of what's going on around you. Some details. If you're going to shoot the, the lights or anything else, for example, in the night sky with a camera and tripod, you want to make sure that the camera is, the tripod is seated firmly on whatever soft surface you are on. If you're on grass or mud or sand in the desert or up north on the snow or ice. If you just plump, plunk your, uh, your tripod down, that is going to settle into that soft surface during time, and your image is going to show that movement. So make sure you set your tripod firmly on whatever soft surface you happen to be on. You want to make sure that everything on your tripod and camera is locked down, because the slightest bit of movement will cause a problem, obviously. If you're working with a camera bag, make sure that camera bag is sealed up, because if you have to change locations, if you have to get up and move and you grab your camera bag that's not been closed up and sealed, everything's going to fall out onto the ground. And that's never a good thing. I've had it happen many times. If you have filters on your camera lenses, remove them when you are photographing the lights. I'll show you an example of why you might want to do that. You want to level your camera so that you get your shot properly and then adjust your camera settings, all this before you even snap the shutter. And overhead, meanwhile, you've got this aurora dancing around and it's becoming very difficult to concentrate because you're trying to watch this display while you're trying to make these adjustments. Another question I always get is what lens should I use? Which lens would be best? Well, let me show you a couple of examples here. I think most of you can imagine that the widest angle lens you possibly you have will probably do the best job. This is a photograph of an aurora display um, one a few years back with a normal 50 millimeter lens on a typical DSLR. This is the same image with a 35 millimeter lens. This is what happens when you have a 24 millimeter focal length lens. And finally, this is a 14 millimeter lens. Yes, it's important to be able to use a wide angle lens. Although, as you saw, you can certainly capture the aurora with any type of a lens at all. But if you want to capture the real experience of being under the lights and they are massive, the widest angle lens you possibly can use is the one to be able to use. It's tough to focus your lens. And for most people, I give them this very, very basic way of focusing. When I focus my lens, I do it in a much more rigorous manner. I will aim toward Polaris, the North Star. I get that centered. I magnify the image of Polaris on my screen, on my LCD screen. And then I use a 10 power loop and I look at that image while I'm changing the focus. And when that image becomes as tiny and sharp as I can make it, then I know my, my camera is focused properly. Uh, I generally use gaffer's tape to tape that focus down. But I will tell you that on a zoom lens, the infinity symbol is not at infinity. So I suggest for folks who are just starting out doing this and don't want to take the time to, to do a focus with a star, with, uh, for example, a Batonoff mask or just, just doing it as I described it. Um, set your lens near the infinity symbol. Aim your camera toward a distant terrestrial object during daylight and focus on that LCD screen. That's going to be fairly close to infinity, and it's going to be just fine for most of the images that you take. Another thing you want to adjust is white balance. Now, I always recommend that people do not shoot in JPEG format, but rather shoot in RAW format. RAW format allows you to adjust the white balance after the fact when you're in post-processing. And I always shoot RAW format, but I also shoot 
JPEGs in parallel so that I have a backup in case something fails with the raw files. But white balance is tricky. If you are shooting just JPEGs, you're going to have to adjust the white balance on your camera. And I can't tell you what that is because every direction you aim your camera, the white balance is going to be different. And auroras will take on different white balance. So I shoot in raw format for a whole bunch of reasons, and I suspect most people listening to this uh, are doing as well. And then you can adjust that white balance after the fact. Now, which one of these is, is best? You can shoot it in daylight, in tungsten, auto white balance. It, it depends on your taste. In Of these three, I would suggest that the auto white balance worked fine. But if I were to shoot that same Aurora uh, in a slightly different direction, I might have to use a slightly different white balance for that. Another thing we have to be concerned with, of course, with simple DSLR cameras is noise. Now, I know you're using noise is a very, very big problem when you're doing astro imaging. Uh, there is no staying images. I mean, your thing is moving so fast that you're fortunate to be able to capture one quick photograph. So you have to be able to get rid of the noise that's there. There was long noise, long exposure noise uh, reduction that you can do. There is also high ISO noise reduction. High ISO noise reduction uh, is what will take care of the uh, noise produced by the amplifier when you kick up your ISO to extremely high numbers that will reduce that noise a little bit. So you can set your cameras a high IS noise reduction if you want to. Long, noise, uh, long exposure noise reduction, however, I would highly recommend against. This is, this is a moving subject. And long exposure uh, reduction will take a photograph, let's say you're taking a, a five second photograph, and when your exposure is finished, it will take a dark frame of five seconds. So you will actually have to wait 10 seconds before you can use your camera again. That is not a good idea when you are using, when you're photographing the Northern Lights because too much and you want to be able to photograph as much as you can. So with my camera, I do not set any noise reduction at all. I figure there is enough very high quality software out there that I can take care of that noise reduction after the fact in post-processing. You should also be aware, as those of you that are doing astro imaging with cooled cameras, you know that you cool that sensor down and your noise goes down significantly. Think about photographing the Northern Lights when it's 40 below zero. That sensor is as happy as a pig in poop. It loves those cold temperatures. I have shot with my Nikon, I have shot as high as 6400 ISO with exposures as short as a third of a second of the Northern Lights, and I have virtually no noise at all. When the temperature is that low, you are cooling that sensor, and it is, it is as happy as can be, and it loves it. So depending on the type of camera you have, depending on the temperature you have, you can get away with some of this. But if you're in the desert, for example, as I live in the desert, if I go out in the summer months when it's 120 Fahrenheit outside and I try to photograph, even at ISO 400, I, I am getting noise to make my images pretty much useless. So that cold temperature makes a big difference. But in general, I do not set any in-camera noise reduction at all because I want to be able to control that after the fact. I mentioned earlier also about taking filters off of your lens. The, a lot of folks who have DSLR cameras keep a UV filter or an, a, a skylight type of filter on the front of their lens. Ask them, it's the answer is, well, just because. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I will use a filter if it's necessary, but if it's not necessary, it's got to come off the camera. And when you are photographing the Northern Lights, I highly recommend removing that filter because if you don't, this is what could happen. Now, this is a close-up of the center of the frame. You notice those, those concentric circles 
at the center of the frame. This is a, a shot by a friend of mine who accidentally left his filter on his lens one night, came to me and asked what's going on. And I said, well, you know, I'll bet you this is a mistake you won't make anymore. Now, this was back in the film days with 35 millimeter cameras. Perhaps this problem has been reduced or eliminated. I have not been brave enough to try and experiment. When the Aurora is going, I wanna get good photos. So I have not put a filter on front, in the front of my lens to test it out. But I'm just saying, be very, very careful. Remove filters, they absorb light. They create reflections, which can cause problems on your final image. And they can do this kind of a, uh, silhouettes on your on the front of your image which is uh, which is never a good thing so you've got all this stuff done now you're ready to aim your camera and you do and this is the the one thing that bugs me more than anything else for god's sake level your camera oh it drives me crazy when i see a horizon that is tilted like that when it's so very very simple to aim your camera and and level it. Many of the newer DSLRs actually have a horizon adjustment. You can actually set your camera manually. Uh, you can actually set it horizontal so your, your landscape is, is correct. Something you need to remember, and, and I think everybody watching this knows this already, but in case someone does not, I need to mention it. What you see with the human an eye is very different from what the camera will see. The human eye is not able to capture colors very well when the light is faint, and it's not very well adapted to pick up detail when the light is faint. A camera can do both, and this is simply a matter of physiology of the eye. So camera is not limited by those physiologies and the camera will pick up real colors and very fine detail if you allow it to do so. This shows the difference between what a camera will see and what the human eye might see. When the aurora is faint, it looks gray, it looks colorless, and it's almost impossible to tell it apart from a cloud except for the way it's moving. As it brightens, of course, then the human eye is able to see more color and its movement becomes, it's very, very clear what it is. When the aurora is very faint, it will be colorless and featureless. When the aurora becomes extremely bright, there is every color in the spectrum that will be visible to the human eye and the camera will pick up all of those, even when the aurora is faint, as you can see in this particular image. And a lot of that can be taken care of in your final processing. Of course, you have to do processing. A lot of the newer cameras, you will get a good good image straight out of the camera if you're shooting in JPEG. But the image that you see is actually a JPEG converted by the camera from its raw format. And so you need to be able to sit down at the computer for four or five minutes afterwards adjust your exposure, your white balance, your contrast, and do a little sharpening. It doesn't have to take you hours and hours. I can look at an image and take care of these things in probably 30 seconds and have it be an okay image. Of course, I'll spend a few minutes or maybe 10, 15 minutes and really tweak it to, to be excellent. But you have to understand the real colors and the real details are there inside of that raw format file. What our job as the photographer is to be able to bring those out. Remember, you're not trying to see this as it appears to the human eye. You're trying to create a photograph and trying to pull out of that raw file everything you possibly can. This is an example of what a raw file might look like and what a processed image would look like. And of course, everyone will have a different thought about what the processed image would look like. What I try to do as my paradigm, I try to, look, there's there's two different realities here. There's the camera's reality, what the camera sees, and there's what the human eye sees, and they are very, very different. Which one do I want to process my images for? Well, typically, if I process it for the camera, it's bright, it's gaudy, it's overly colorful and overly sharp, and it's just too much for me. If I process it for what the human eye sees, I'm going to have an awful lot of black and white images. 
So what I try to do is somewhere in between. I want to get somewhere where I can see the real colors and yet not be overly gaudy. So I try to match it as closely as I can to what the human eye can see, but give it a little bit more oomph to it because it is actually a photograph. This is a raw file of a corona directly from the camera. You can see the colors are there, 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 the details are there, the stars are there, a little bit of processing, and it becomes a just an absolutely gorgeous image. But all those colors are quite real. And another corona. This was one of the best coronas that, uh, that I've seen in recent years. And you can see, even on that raw file, those colors are there. And yes, we could see them with the human eye. A little bit of processing and you bring it out. Now these coronas move very, very rapidly. So your exposures have to be short. And I'm talking less than five seconds. The shorter it is, the more detail you will capture. If you follow these types of tips that I've given you, you're going to pick up some good auroras, whether you are up in the northern part of the world, up in Alaska or Canada, Norway, Iceland, places near the Arctic Circle, or whether you're in the southern part of the world, down in the southern US, for example, or even southern Europe, you may pick up the northern lights here from time to time. I would highly recommend paying very close attention to the solar activity, to the uh, auroral oval, to the probability curves, to the K index, because over the next two or three years, we are going to be climbing up that, that solar activity cycle. And we're going to be seeing a lot of solar activity and a lot of CMEs and a lot of coronal holes are gonna be blowing material in our direction. And that aurora is going to be uh, migrating farther and farther south more frequently. So pay close attention to those numbers and guarantee you're going to be able to get some terrific images and people just won't even believe you've, you've actually been able to do that. So with that, I'm going to uh, close my presentation and see if anyone has any questions that I can try to answer for you. Oh, oh I, Dennis, can't what I didn't say anything that... Dennis? <laughs> yes. So what kind of process yes. processing can, do you, you actually do? I have used for, for the past 10 or 15 years, I start with Lightroom and then I go to Photoshop. Now I've just started using Topaz a little bit. So I'm going to be mixing quick. and matching Topaz. I'm going to be mixing and matching to Topaz okay. and Lightroom. Did, did that work? Uh, yeah, so you, I mean, you enhance I, the color. Uh, what kind of process do you use within, say, Lightroom, Photoshop, or Topaz? Well, the first thing the first thing I will do when I go into Lightroom is I take care of some details and I take care of noise. I try to take care of noise reduction. Again, like I said, I just started using Topaz, so I'm pl still playing around with that. But we, let's say in Lightroom, the first thing I do is I try to take care of some noise reduction and uh, kind of clean up the image like that. Then I will go to the, uh, uh, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't, I can't remember what all the details are. But a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go to the, I start with some of the smaller things like noise reduction. And then I go to the big things, the big adjustments, okay? The brightness, the color, the contrast, the clarity. Um, and it really, there is no formula. It's a, you know, it's just like any other image that you're processing. Every image is different. And so I just have to poke around and see what works. Dennis? Um... I know yes, it's, sir. Not, it's not necessary to do all the things that we do in astro imaging um, with calibration, dark frames, and all that other stuff. But you can do all that stuff. You can take dark frames. You can do flat frames, particularly if you've got uh, um, vignetting and things like that, and you want to kind of balance it out. Uh, Absolutely. And when, yeah. When Dennis Absolutely, was talking, yeah. yeah, yeah. When Dennis was talking about how he. Um, uh, uh, when De Dennis was talking about how um, uh, he takes uh, uh, well, some people take an exposure and then have the dark noise reduction where they, they take it dark immediately and then subtract it. If you want to use darks, 
go ahead and take 10 or 15 or 20 darks at approximately the same exposure values and things like that and stack them just like you always do and subtract them from your raw and you can take you can use the same kind of uh noise reduction techniques that you use in in fancy dan astro imaging processing that you, you guys can, do you can but you remember you're going to have a very very heavy duty database of dorks uh, because mm -hmm. remember you have to shoot these at the right uh, at the right exposure and i'm assuming at the correct temperature the temperatures are changing your exposures are constantly changing and so you should have yourself yeah. a very very good library of different temperatures and exposures and then yeah the darks will definitely help no question about it even the flats will help uh no question about that i've never done it uh, because I I get very very high quality images that I'm perfectly satisfied with, and unless I'm planning on ex uh, 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 enlarging it to the size of a of a bus, uh, I really don't need that extra that mm -hmm. extra effort. But and when, also when you're in re really cold temperature, uh, the, the temperature changes quite a bit, and your exposures are changing. So you're going to have a you're going to have to build some kind of a library for yourself. But I think that would be a great thing to do, and I never thought of doing it. Maybe next year I'll try that. Uh, uh, can you say anything about uh, if you want to shoot these time lapse? That was a fascinating little time lapse that you showed earlier. And most of our DSLRs will take videos if we ask them to. A time lapse is great. What you can do is you can set up a camera, just a regular DSLR, set it to do. Uh, I just use a cheap remote and I turn it on and I have it just click constantly one after the other after the other. Of course, that slows down once the buffer starts filling up, but I will take like one frame every second or two seconds. And then when you're finished, you've got this, this, this database of images that you can string together into a time lapse. The problem I have with that is the fact that it's a very, very rapid moving uh, image very rapid moving time lapse and it's very unrealistic to the way the way the aurora looks newer cameras though are quite capable of doing real-time video particularly the sony the a6 and a7 can if you have a very fast lens like a 1.4 for example you can do real-time video that is spectacular just handheld even the phones the some of the newer phones are able to do it so you have a choice. You can do the time lapse uh, with a DSLR or even a phone, or you can do a real time video. I uh, personally, I like the real time video because it shows what you're actually able to see with the eye. Um, Dennis, tell us about what coal does to a battery and how you prevent that. Well, I generally, when I'm in a very, very cold environment, I keep three spare batteries on an inside pocket in my shirt. Uh, when the battery starts to wear down in my camera, I pull it out. I pull one of the, uh, the the good batteries from my left shirt pocket, put it in the camera, take the cold one, put it in my right shirt pocket, close up my jacket again. When that one wears down, I go through the same process. By the time I use all four batteries, the ones that I pulled out of the camera have warmed up and they're activated once again. It will sap the strength of your batteries. I have personally, uh, I've never had a real problem with it, except for one night. We had the temperatures down to around 40, 45 below zero one night, and we had a 24 minute Aurora display. That was crazy, absolutely crazy. Changed batteries in 24 minutes because it was so cold. And I missed a lot. It was always. Was that, was that minus 40 in? in uh, centigrade or Fahrenheit? <laughs> that's that's a chemistry yeah. one on one question. <laughs> yeah. that, um, Astrobasti suggests that he brings an extra power bank. That's a great idea, but where are you going to keep that extra power bank? <laughs> it's going to get cold. Dennis, you suggest that you can run your camera off an external battery? Yeah, but you got the same problem it's still going to get cold. Dennis, are you still with us? Dennis looks like he's blanked out. Uh oh. Dennis? Uh, his internet's been a little bit, well, I don't know if it's my internet or his internet. Yeah, it's it's get cut out a little bit during the print, but you know, we I think yeah, we he, got everything. Dennis, are you, can you hear us anymore? Or are you, uh, 
I'll try calling him. He may not know yeah. he's gone. Say hello. <laughs> oh, I better not be sharing well, my screen. Yeah, at, at least, least we got most of the way through this time. <laughs> we got well, yeah, the, <laughs> we've, we've got his phone number. We'll go look for him. All right. Uh, well, for every, all you people online, we're trying to get Dennis back. Uh, we got yeah. his phone number just in situations like this. So give us a couple minutes if you want to hang with us. Well, up. Oh, oh now, he's dropped off. Yeah. Now he's dropped off. Let's go get uh, Dennis. Well, while you do that, I can talk about how I do a DSLR darks library. Oh, yeah. Go uh, ahead and do that. Yeah. So I used to shoot with uh, DSLR for all my deep sky astrophotography until I got a uh, a fancy uh, astro camera, and I still use my DSLR sometimes uh, for deep sky. And the same rule would apply for Aurora, where you can you, you can utilize dark frames. <clears throat> so um, I put my DSLR out on the back porch every night, and um, I'd either use an intervalometer set to a single exposure time, or plug it into a computer and run a sequence of dark frames with different exposure times. And then I have a USB thermometer that stores all the temperatures and then I load them into a spreadsheet the, the next morning. And then I'd go through, oh, I think we have him back. <laughs> Dennis, are you with us again? A little bit choppy. Turn If you turn off your video, Dennis, we might be able to get your audio. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Dennis. Click, click on the little microphone button on the bottom. You're still it's in muted. that bottom row of icons, uh, like where the uh, the present button was. There's a microphone button on the far left. I think we've lost Dennis again. Uh, well, He's I'll finish my sentence <laughs> until he comes back. Um, so. Uh, yeah, then I download all the dark frames in the morning, match them up with the timestamps and the temperatures, and sort them into folders. I was doing by two degrees Fahrenheit, but uh, you can do, you can probably get away with like five degrees Fahrenheit or maybe like two or five degrees Celsius. Um, not to experiment a bit. But yeah, and then stack your dark frames, and then you can just keep the master darks. And uh, yes, yeah, so that's how I, so you can make a darks library with your DSLR that you don't need to take new darks after every night or something like that. Uh, Dennis, turn off your video and you'll, your bandwidth will go uh, Dennis further. is turn sometimes here and video. sometimes not. He's moving right now, but he's uh, turned off his, um, he's muted himself, I think. No. And, and, and he keeps him. looking at the phone saying, who the heck's calling me? No, I just heard him. <laughs> okay. I have no idea to turn that video off. Hold on a second. Yeah, there, there, you go. Go. there you go. There you go. Right, your your we bandwidth go, right? will go further now. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So you got me now. Yeah. Yep. You're good. Okay. You're good. And don't don't bother answering the phone call I've been making to you. Yeah. Oh, don't I bother ever answering. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, where were we? Uh, I think, Molly, well, I, did you I finish your thought like, about? I really just like the idea for. Uh, I really like the idea for doing the darks, and I'm going to try that next year. Compare it with some of the others and see how it works out. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, thanks. Molly, did you finish your um, presentation yeah. about that? Okay, yeah. cool. So what if we do darks, do we do flats too? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't do flats unless like there's a dust spot on the sensor I've not been able to clean or something like that. Uh, because with the lens lens profiles that are loaded into Photoshop, you can undo the vignetting and the stuff like that uh, with the lens profile. So um, I don't bother to do flats for my camera lenses. I don't. I you know I couldn't hear Molly while she was um, while I was calling, uh, but um, uh, ah, it's gone. Never mind. Yeah, no worries. I, okay. I was talking about uh, how I do my dark libraries for my DSLR. Yeah, uh, Dennis. You know, I, when you talk about temperatures being that low, I mean it must be horrible to try to keep warm when you're not really moving around here. What do your what do you do to prevent the you know, heat from getting cold and never warming up? Uh, you just get cold. First of all, look, my, my philosophy is that there is no such thing as cold weather, just poor clothing choices. 
So if you dress properly, you're not going to be as cold as you think. In fact, the last couple of years, we've only got down to maybe 20 below zero Fahrenheit uh, the, the, the last couple of years. And I've had to peel layers off because, you know, when you're dressed properly, it's not a big problem. The place where I have a problem is in my fingers because I refuse to wear gloves when I'm trying to operate equipment. So uh, my hands get very, very cold. But you try to warm up whenever you can, and uh, you just deal with it. It's it's uh, you know if you're dressed properly, it's not so bad. Do you ever use those uh, battery powered garments to keep your you know battery powered socks and vests? And I've I've heard of them. Uh, I have not. In fact, I have these uh, you know these chemical packs, you know, the toe warmers and stuff like that. And every year I buy a couple and take them up to Alaska with me, and I never use them. So I have a, they're, they're piling up in my closet. I never use them. I either I produce a lot of heat on my own, or I don't know. I just don't need the. I just don't need it apparently. You know, minus that's twenty. Really I mean, work. you know, that's that's pretty wimpy cold. I mean, well, you know, the folk, the, the amateur astronomy club in Fairbanks. Uh, it, it's it's a very interesting boy. These 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 guys are tough. Uh, I asked them what, then you know, what, what is it that would make them stop observing? And their answer is when it reaches 40 below. And of course, my question then was the same as everybody else would ask, what is it about 40 below that makes the difference? And the response is, well, that's when the equipment starts to break. So that's when they quit. But otherwise, they would just keep on going. And, you know, like I say, you dress properly and you're going to be fine in those cold temperatures. And eat well. And eat well. Oh boy, there's no problem in that when it's cold. <laughs> um, I know uh, I've been on these expeditions before, and there is usually a warming hut involved if you if you work it right. I mean, you can just believe it or not, you can go to Fairbanks, for instance, and, in your rental car, and just drive to the you know to various places and and do all this stuff. But you can also get um, you know, uh, warming huts and all, all sorts of restaurants and things like that. Yeah. One of the things I do to cheat when I am up there by myself, as opposed to with my groups, but when I'm by myself and I do have a rental car, I will go out to an observing site and I will sit in the warm rental car and uh, the camera stays outside though. I make sure it stays cold. I sit in the warm rental car and I have a uh, my iPad that I am watching gun smoke reruns and I have my phone that I've got an Aurora webcam and I'm watching the webcam. So I don't even have to step out of the car. I just sit there and I watch the webcam. When the webcam gets interesting, I shut everything off and I go back outside. But uh, that's that's cheating, I guess. But you're yeah, right, Alex. Well, on these group tours, yeah, there's always warming huts, always places to go to stay warm. Yeah, can you can you set up a webcam and just record a video for the night and get something interesting? I I suppose so, but I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't know how. I mean, I turn on my PowerPoint here, uh, but uh, I, I webcams all over the world. Aurora webcams. There's one in Fairbanks, uh, a couple in Fairbanks. There's, there's a couple in Iceland and Norway. Uh, Some of you more technical guys would be able to set that up just for the night. Hmm. Okay. Uh, there haven't been really a lot of questions come in. Uh, my point came back on on um, uh, Molly is that uh, read your uh, sensor temperature in the raw file. Don't just rely on what the ambient temperature was when you took the darks. I don't think uh, DSLRs have a, a, a temperature. I they, well, they used to. It's been a while since I've used my DSLR, but they they had they recorded sensor temp in the I think in the Canons. It'd be super but, helpful if it did. Uh, I don't think my, I don't think my Nikon's do. Okay, um, Greg D wants to know what the what Bordel zone where it's worth for an uh, Aurora imaging session. Well, if you're asking me, uh, you can, if they're bright, you can see them from the middle of a city. 
Now they're 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 very obvious to see right from the street lights. Uh, but if it's faint, let's say you live in southern U.S., for example, a place where it's fairly far from the Arctic Circle, uh, you probably would need four. You know, I, I live in Bordeaux four, but uh, that would probably be the. Yeah, but those aurora pictures you were taking. By the way, how far are you from the Mexican border? I'm guessing forty miles. By the crow fly? No, as, as the crow flies, yeah, probably so. Okay. And then an additional 40 miles, you got the Coachella Valley. And so you're oh, looking we, through a light dome up there. And, and that's where light, the aurora yeah, is. We have, right? light, we have light pollution all around us. We have uh, the Coachella Valley to the northeast. We have uh, L.A. and Orange County to the northwest. We have right. San Diego to the southwest and Mexico and Mexicali down to the uh, to southeast. And we have a huge light dome going around us. So, yeah. but it's but it's Bordeaux four, and and yeah, that's a great that's great when the aurora is faint. But if it's bright, yeah, and you're far north, you can see it from yeah. even bright cities. Okay, I think it's about time to wrap it up. We got any other questions out there? I think we're all set. You got a few comments. You got a few people excited. Uh, you got a couple of people that are going. They already got it on their plan, and a couple of people got it on their bucket list, it looks like. So looks like they're getting ready to go, and I think you inspired them, Dennis. Well, thank you, and, and thank you guys for inviting me to come on. I know this is very, very different from what you normally do, but uh, I, I think it's important photography as well. Important. And if anyone does have questions down the road, please drop me a note. Yeah. yeah Dennis, that was, that was is, Dennis is going to be at nightfall next November if you guys want to meet him and, and listen to an excellent star talk he gives. We, uh, he comes to Nightfall every year. It's one of the ways I knew him. So, okay, we're gonna check out. Uh, Patrick is in charge. So we'll all wave goodbye. Good night, everyone. Out. Check us out. We won't see you next week, but we'll see yeah. you in two weeks. Yeah, we'll see you back in two weeks. Some of us will see you next week. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready now, Patrick.